Okay. Y'all, that was that was intense for a second. I don't know if you caught how intense that was, but I was over here doing computer things and it was crazy. It was like robbing a bank and fleeing the country and stopping a nuclear war. I did it all just now. I don't need any recognition, but you know. I do, yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to open it and get the kids out, the toys out for the kids. Sure, I can do that. I thought you could. Yep. They probably gave me a master key. Oh, I gotta go get my key. Do the soft shoe routine, Susie, while I go get it. Do the soft shoe routine. For some reason, he wants to put all the cookies on the couch. How about cookies on the neck? Oh, it's okay, you want it. Yeah, get a napkin. Let's get some napkins. Go help get a napkin. Help Theodore, go get a napkin. Mommy. Hello, my water bottle. Wait, I really forgot your water bottle. You can have some of oh, my water. Got some. No, not okay, you know what? Jared's gotta get some, some toys out. Yeah. And you want water, don't you? I think when we're in church, you can ask for a cup, please. Yeah, you can ask for a cup. My name is Michael, by the way. Michael, hi, I'm Jamie. Nice to meet you. Were you here last week? Um, I was here last week. Yeah, yeah. I was on the screen. Yeah. Okay. I was with them at home. <laughs> yeah. okay. Oh, Chloe. Me and Cameron. That's my husband, man. And our two boys. <laughs> and what are their names? Elvie and Theo. Leanne. Okay, this is Leander. Yeah. <laughs> that's how we, we call him Elvie. That's his nickname. Oh, that's okay. Leander Benjamin. Elvie. <laughs> Very long name. Not Theo. <laughs> It's pretty rare. Yeah. It's nice. Look, guys. Your name is kind of rare, isn't it? And for girls, especially? Yeah. Um, it used to be more so, but it's a biblical name. I think we have a standard biblical name, too. No. Well, it's a Greek mythological name. We don't have a projector. Okay. He's still. Uh, he's on. He still is uh, struggling with uh, a fever, and but luckily he's been cleared of COVID. That uh, Cameron, that's correct. Yes. Say what? Uh, we're everyone's inquiring of how your recovery is coming oh. along. You were cleared of COVID, but you've got this lingering flu thing. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm feeling a little bit better now, but you can still hear it in my voice. So, for sure. Um, yeah, hopefully, I'll be better in a couple of days. Like, I mean, I have more energy today than I've had in the past. So, um, can you turn the video on? Because I can't see any of you guys. Oh, yeah, I totally can do that. That's, that's me. I'm actually going to, I know you all want to see Cameron. I'm going to put him on the laptop. I don't see anyone coming on. So, that's good. And then we can get started after all this hullabaloo. There it is. Okay. All right. Hi, Cameron. Hi. There you are. Okay. And that way I can use this to do this. All right. All right. All right. There's a PowerPoint coming up. Whoop, whoop. Oh. OK. 
Can you see that? I can turn this because can you still see it? Yeah. It's super important that you see it because it's pretty. <laughs> I mean, that's really, that's what PowerPoints are there for is this eye appeal. Um, all right. Without any further ado, let's open with prayer and uh, then we'll jump into today's conversation. It is good to have you all here. I Klein is uh, recently returned to St. John's after the pandemic, but was away for a couple months in Liberia. And so uh, was here for church for the first time. So just stick around, join us for basic stuff. Thanks for staying, stick around. Um, and it's good to see you all back again. So thanks for being here today. And if anyone does join us online, Cameron, will you just sort of boop me so we know we've got an extra person with us? But right yeah. now, I just see the two. Totally. I can do me. that. Awesome. Uh, anything that I can be praying for for you, your families, your household, uh, discernment, health, things like that, what's going on in your lives? I always feel like that's a way we can build community is by holding the knowledge of the daily struggles and successes. Uh, so as we open in prayer, anything I can pray about? Um, life is so <laughs> I love There's that. a little bit of overwhelm. Yeah. Okay. I, I totally get that. <laughs> it's all good. Absolutely. Good. I, I can do that. Anything on your end, Monday? Anything I can do? Oh, no, it's too late. My spouse and I just recently went back to the Kansas area, so just anything I can do discuss for you. Usually, it comes part and parcel with a transition. I'm hearing the stress, I, I feel it too. Like, uh, my wife and I like to joke that October is is like hell month, uh, for just because with, with transition. The change of seasons, if you follow the academic calendar, like it all that happens, and it's certainly not in my line. Um, I saw a meme the other day that just said, um, um, this month I'm taking the October challenge, which means I'm just going to try to survive to the end of October, and if I do, I, I win the challenge. Um, and then there's like major holidays coming up. So like, yeah. Exactly, and then we're, in this year, we're being told, do all the planning yeah. like yesterday, <laughs> 20 weeks ago. So uh, let's start with prayer for all that we're holding with us right now. And it's okay, prayer can be kinetic, so let us pray. God, you are with us in the highs and lows, in the peaceful moments and the chaotic ones. You are the voice in the still, small, quiet moments, just as you are with us in the storming moments of life. Be with us now in this space. Quiet our hearts enough that we may hear you speaking to us. Words of comfort and care. Be with, be with us in the midst of moving and transition, in the midst of just how chaotic and stressful this time of year can be. Be with us as we try to do the grand things of life, like working to end uh, abuse and to bring some awareness to disabilities in far-flung places that may not be as known to all of us here, but that are dear and near to some and that we can care for in this moment. We pray all of these things and much, much more. We pray for Cameron and his ongoing healing. And we pray for those who are grieving today and those who are hopeful. Be with us as we learn and help us to ask big questions and be unsatisfied with simple answers. In your name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to talk about authority, which I cannot say without hearing Cartman in my Head, I'm sorry, I'm not sacrilegious like that. Um, I'm gonna do a quick adjustment here, hold on. Let's see if I can do this without breaking everything. If I do this, am I gonna block you, uh, Micah, from being able to see? Okay, cool, all right. Um, we're gonna talk about authority because, uh, strangely enough, there's a big, day today, not just Halloween, but Lutherans are celebrating the Reformation today. There's this like other thing going on on this uh, day. And so a few of our members wore red shirts, former recovering Lutherans and still Lutherans at heart. And I think we Episcopalians certainly uh, benefit a lot from that. And Luther himself, it's really appropriate we're talking about this, was all kinds of concerned about 
authority, right? He was wrestling with that. And so when we heard uh, Jay last week, we were hearing about, was it last week, two weeks ago? I've lost track of time. Last week, about the history of the church, right? And we were talking about like, where does authority reside? And then how did that affect the history of our particular branch of tradition? But it has played out in every tradition because those uh, who have power usually seek to preserve it. And with power usually comes the dynamic of what is authority, what is power. Um, but that can often cast the conversation in just a pejorative sense or negative. There is a lot that can be gained from understanding good use of power and why we need to know where the boundaries are, right? The authorities that we respect, give assent to, and that guide us. And that's kind of what this conversation is about. I'm going to be uh, very open. It's, uh, it's guided by pretty pictures, but it's meant to be a conversation. So um, Episcopal authority hinges on this question, fancy two fancy words, orthopraxy versus orthodoxy. Most of us are familiar with orthodoxy, uh, right knowledge, right belief, right uh, knowing. Uh, orthopraxy, some of us have heard it. We definitely can put the two words together. You know, we, we know that uh, it's about praxis. Um, and so it's about the right action, the right doing, the right being. And so in uh, th that's an easy breakdown to put those two in dichotomy with each other. But I do think so many people coming to the Episcopal Church from outside the tradition are coming from with, with questions about orthodoxy. Many people ask in these classes, like, what does the Episcopal Church believe about, and then fill in the blank. That's a pretty common question. Maybe you are sitting here today like, what does the Episcopal Church believe about? I remember the first priest that welcomed us into the Episcopal Church, and my wife was like, uh, not even a recovering Baptist, just, just had been Baptist and was like following with me, like, yeah, sure, Episcopal, sounds great. Like, we just need to go to church, because Baptist, not like that much concern about, is it Baptist over the door? Just do they believe the right things is more of the Baptist concern. And so we were at home one night and Aaron was like, I really like this. I like the liturgy. It feels formal, but there are a few things that worry me. Like there's a giant painting of Mary over the piano. And um, I was new to the Episcopal Church too. And I was like, I, it just seems like a painting to me. Like I haven't heard a lot of Mary talk in this church. And I, I know they're not Catholics, but let's ask. So we asked, what does the Episcopal Church believe about Mary? And we got like this whole big, huge conversation that was both confusing and not helpful. And I went home like, I think they, they, he said it's cool if we don't get down with everyone's beliefs about Mary. That's what I think I heard. But I don't know what they believe, like what the diversity of beliefs are yet. So I, that was hard to discern. And the reason that it's hard to discern is that when Episcopalians get asked, what do you believe? We will tell you what we do. So if you want to know what we believe, we will hand you the prayer book. The prayer book is not a statement of doctrinal beliefs like a lot of traditions have. If you go to most even small parishes or mega churches, there will always be a what we believe page on their website, right? You can follow down like, are they doctrinally orthodox in these areas? Episcopalians will hand you the prayer book, which certainly has things that you could say we believe. It even says every Sunday we believe in, uh, but more so it's a collection of what we do, different worship services, different moments of life, and then there's poetry, there's scripture, there are doctrinal statements, and they're held all together in tension because you can never reconcile art with argument completely. They're all held in tension as what we believe, and that's because orthopraxy. And that comes, at least in part, from this guy. Richard Hooker, who has an unfortunate name and uh, didn't know it at the time, but later in life that would bother him and haunt him. Um, Hooker was, uh, is actually the, the patron saint of the, uh, for the day that I was ordained um, on November the 3rd, uh, so coming right up here, and was relatively unregarded, not well known and not very popular until uh, much later into almost uh, the modern era, but in, certainly in the Enlightenment. Um, he was sort of uh, the, the person behind what uh, Jay talked about, the Elizabethan settlement, much of his theology that set up sort of a, a core Anglican middle way can be attributed to this guy. Um, and what Hooker taught was that there is essentially what we refer to now as the three-legged stool of Anglicanism. If you've been trolling Episcopal on the web, 
trying to figure out who we are, what we believe, you've probably come across this term, the three-legged stool. Um, if you're a former Methodist or you worship with Methodist, they will say the four-sided quadrilateral, which comes from Anglican's three-legged stool. And they are, as said here by Bishop Ramsey, uh, scripture, tradition, and reason. But those three things, they're not really unique to us. Ultimately, Catholic and Orthodox uh, people, even Lutherans, hold in some regard that these three things are kind of uh, supportive. Lutherans will say, and scripture sits on top of the stack, and the other two are holding it up. But these are the three sources of our tradition in Anglicanism, and we regard them as co-equal sources in our experience. There's that word, Methodist added experience, because uh, you can't just hold these three things sort of off to the side without taking into, into account our own lived life experience and how that, how that both refines reason and how that also helps us see scripture through our eyes. There's no like tabula rasa receiving the Bible, right? You don't just read it and go, ah, what did the original people say? And it's discernible. Like you're already throwing yourself into the pages when you start reading it. Um, but for that reason, we feel like scripture and tradition and reason have experience that's like a, a thread that runs through them. And so we haven't added them. Uh, needless to say, Methodism was started by a good Anglican priest who never himself became a Methodist. So there you are. We're not super proud of that and tell everyone that every chance we get ever. Um, Bishop Ramsey, one of our more uh, well-known archbishops of Canterbury, which we can talk about that whole role later, but was mentioned by Jay, said this, the method use and direction characteristic of Anglican divinity or really just Anglican life first came into clear light, as I said earlier, in Hooker. His theology claimed to do both far less. In other words, he wasn't trying to build a summa, a big, huge philosophical, you know, doctrinal statement, um, but also far more. It did far less in that it eschewed any attempt to offer a complete scheme of biblical doctrine or an experiential assurance of justification or an infallible system of dogma. Those are big words. But essentially, Luther, justification, right? He wanted to make sure that the soul was justified and righteous before God. And that became the big question, where how do you find justification? Um, and then, of course, infallible, that's a word that if you've come out of the evangelical tradition, you know that really well, infallible or inerrant. Um, and not just the evangelical tradition. Some uh, conservative Lutherans, some conservative Presbyterians, even some conservative Methodists will talk about infallibility um, so that dogma holds together and isn't brought down by a, some pinhole in it. It did more though, in that it appealed to the larger field of authority, a larger field, and dealt with the whole person rather than with certain parts because it appealed to scripture, tradition, and reason. And it dealt with the whole person both by its reverence for his, their reason and their conscience and by its refusal to draw a circle around the inward personal element in religion and to separate it from external worldly things. You, Episcopalians love to say that uh, Anglicanism or Epis the Episcopal Church is very incarnational. I feel like that's a little bit rude of us to pretend like we're the only ones who are incarnational. Every church probably thinks that they have some really incarnational element, but because we're about orthopraxy uh, and not just orthodoxy, we're not living up here. Like the life of the faith is, doesn't start and end here it genuinely involves the whole person incarnate in a moment in the world surrounded by it. But all of this is just philosophical mumbo jumbo theology, 60 cent words and all that. What do we actually say about these things? So scripture, we all want to start with scripture. This is, this is if you come from another tradition, unless you came from the Roman Catholic church, and even then often people say, what about the Bible? And so scripture is a, uh, even using the word scripture instead of, you know, sacred text or the good book or the Bible, if I call it scripture, what am I saying? Like, what do I mean when I say scripture? Anyone want to take a stab as opposed to saying just the Bible or the New Testament? What's that? It's ours. It's ours in what way? Is it just a book? Is it more than that? When we say scripture, we actually are loading the term with a little more, aren't we? Yeah. Right, yeah. Pine, you said you were saying something? Yeah. 
other other special existence so that we just let the, the law yeah yeah so this is what this is what we made by as a system we go back also teaches our story also teaches our lesson all those things absolutely and and so in a way what you're saying is scripture is sacred it's not just a book it's it's actually set apart by this community by our it's our book and it loses its meaning when it leaves the community in a way and the, and the meaning that it has for us at least um which is really funny because in seminary at least most seminaries most moderate to progressive seminaries and even some conservative seminaries if you're studying scripture studying bible if you're actually in classes taking your new testament and your old testament you step out of the world for some reason in language from sacred text and they re require you almost like every biblical scholar will say please first refer to this as the text because what we want to do is get first past like how we have like what we've read meaning into it and, and and can only get to those objective things that were meant in it by stepping away from our meanings not to say we abandon them but we have to like set them aside that's true in almost any other discourse right if you're an english major if you're um philosophy you have to set aside your own beliefs for a moment as if you can really do that but that's the intent of this of scholarship right right so don't forget the things you learned about how to be a critical reader of texts right like you have to like ask questions what did the author where were they living what did they do like what was the role of women in that culture what was like who, who are these philistines uh, I don't know if you watch Ted Lasso, but uh, one of the main characters comes in and says, you Philistines, and like proceeds with a tirade where he completely misinterprets who Philistines actually were. And then as he's about to leave, one of the coaches is like, I think you need to go look up Philistine and, like in the dictionary. And it was a great moment for the biblical scholars. Like, yes, that's such a, like we, we misuse so many biblical terms. So scripture, here are some, this is just like a, like a, a grab bag meant to kind of get us going, but here are some of the ways we think of scripture it's heard in liturgy i start there because this is very very episcopalian of course scripture is heard in every church tradition in their liturgy a good i grew up assemblies of god and presbyterian assemblies of god would say we don't have liturgy we just do worship and really sometimes worship just means music and then we have prayer and then we have sermons but there's liturgy liturgy just means like the order of the way we do things in community what are the people how do we do it so if you have an intentionally casual liturgy, it's still liturgy. Um, so we hear scripture in a community of believing people who are trying to learn something from it. In our tradition, how, I mean, you're new to the church, but you probably have been paying attention. How do we read scripture in the liturgy? What are some actual physical things you notice about it? What are some things you've uh, seen? Like the trappings around how we present scripture where it's read and how it's read and the word that precede it and follow it, like that kind of stuff. Usually not from the pastor or the priest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they say a reading from yep. John or reading from Luke. Yeah. That's great. There's one other piece of scripture we read every week that's different than that. Psalms. Psalms are how we do the Psalms. Yeah, how do we read them? Usually, uh, on, at, yep. Yep, back and forth. And often sung at 10 o'clock, we actually chant them back and forth in response. The Psalms are the, the, the Jewish people, or the, the Israelites, the earliest like hymn book. That, that, was, that was how it was done. It was sort of, these are the songs that we're setting aside. We've actually, we've actually put them down into this beautiful volume we call Psalms. And then we're gonna say them to each other. And so many ways, the most ancient thing we do each week as Christians who are people of the the New Testament as well, is we actually say the Psalms together in unison back and forth, just like our Jewish forebears did. Probably different tunes, but. He is known as a, as a musical guy, a guy. Yeah. And then there's one other piece of scripture that we prize in our tradition, highest of all, and that's the gospel. And so when the gospels read, you'll probably notice this, the book itself is not the whole Bible, just the four Gospels, is set on the altar itself and is retrieved only by a clergy person, usually the deacon if we have a deacon, but if a deacon's not present, then the priest would do it. If the priest isn't there, the bishop would do it, but 
is only proclaimed by a, an ordained person, meant to sort of say that person's set apart, that book is set apart, this moment is set apart, and then we all do what? We, we stand up, right? We're actually giving like complete honor to it. There's, again, another corollary to, to Jewish worship, right? Have you ever been in a synagogue when the Torah is read? Like we all stand and it's paraded around the room and it's brought into the midst of the congregation and it's, there's like, yeah, it's like a ceremony, right? So there, there's some correlation there. We're, we're prizing this because the, the Jews have more scripture than just Torah, right? Like there's, there's, there are all these like uh, commentaries and things that are sacred as well, but it's the most important part of it. And for us, the gospels are the most important part of it because no surprise, those are the things that were said about or by Jesus in our tradition, right? And so that makes sense that what Paul said, commenting on what Jesus said, important, not as important. You know, what James and Timothy were trying to figure out, important, not as important. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, when so say you say the core gospel story, yeah. like, Matthew, Mark, Luke, yeah. and John. And so you wouldn't have the way to Not in Eucharist. No, any, any other time, yes, you would. Um, but in Eucharist, there's like this, again, we're kind of like, it It all builds like a great dinner party. Right? Like, there's like this opening part, and you're sort of setting the stage. Here's what we're doing. Everybody, we're gathering in this purpose. And then here's our stories. And then there's this story. And let's sing a song. And then there's this story and now we're going to head to the dinner like it's sort of like getting bigger and bigger and so there are roles to be played in evening prayer morning prayer yeah i mean i feel the same way when the deacon is present i want to read the gospel too so totally get it yeah right um if i i normally uh play a video but it, it'll take too long here that if you want to scribble down ellen davis and scripture, go to YouTube. There's a fantastic interview with her. Um, and one of the most important things she says in this interview, she's a, a biblical scholar at Duke Divinity School, or was until her retirement, is that scripture is a self-authenticating statement, right? It doesn't mean, like, if, if a Jew is reading the gospel, they will not say this is scripture, because it is something that is authenticated by the way we read it and, and in the community with which we read it. Um, I think it's important to note that we, the community's uh, discernment of the meaning of scripture is changed by context. The context changes how we discern what is, is happening in scripture. So both our current context, but also the origin context. Um, and then I think just, just to restate the obvious, we read scripture in a multiplicity of ways. Devotionally, um, you, I was new to this term when I got to this church, uh, to the Episcopal Church, Lexio Divina, which is done both in Catholic circles, Lutheran circles, Episcopal circles, Orthodox cir circles, really leading, reading with uh, divine eyes. Um, it's not dissimilar from how, say, an evangelical Bible study might go. We read it, we ask some hard questions of the Bible, but at the end, people are moving in the direction of like, I really felt led by God because this I read this morning. Um, there are connections in that same way. It's not so subjective, but it's let's listen together. What is the scripture calling upon us to do? Um, you could do uh, gospel-based discipleship, which is also similar, but uh, born of communities that were um, using Bible as a liberating document. So out of indigenous culture, out of African culture. So similar style, but uh, with a very liberative lens. Again, liturgically, we read it in the liturgy, daily office, Eucharist, Psalms, funerals, weddings. Um, you'll even find in the prayer book, some of the prayers are like snippets of scripture that have been restyled into the prayer. Uh, we read it theologically, we read it as poetry, we read it as history remembered, we read it as literature, all those things. The Book of Common Prayer asks of every ordinand, every person, deacon, priest, or bishop to be ordained, can they affirm this statement, which always problematizes everything I've just said about scripture. <laughs> the bishop will ask the one to be ordained. Do you believe the holy scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments to be the word of God and to contain 
and this is such a loaded sentence, all things necessary to salvation. In that little snippet, you get the premise of what modern evangelicals and fundamentalists call inerrancy. In other words, does it have everything necessary? Is it, is it going to lead you to error, or is it going to lead you to truth? In many ways, Episcopalians are inerrantists. We believe that scripture contains everything you need. It's not that it contains the only things, that, but it's all the necessary things for salvation. And what is salvation? We can get into that whole conversation in a moment, but uh, we're here to talk about authority. <laughs> um, but it's not infallible. Infallible means that it has a logical internal coherency that has to reconcile so that when uh, the sermon on the mount happens in one gospel and the gospel writer says this sermon happened on a mountain and the next gospel writer is like nah it happened on the plane the sermon on the plane now are these things going to lead people into degradation and sin and hell no they're just two different uh perspectives with lots of great truths in them and we should regard both as scripture that one remembers it or wants you to hear it on a mountaintop and one remembers it or wants you to hear it on a plane actually has some meaning in it. Well, why would an author place this story on a mountaintop? And why would they bring it down onto the plane? Well, that's an interesting question. It changes how we hear it. It doesn't change the truth of either side of it. It doesn't make one wrong and one right or one history remembered and one misremembered. That's not the question that scripture is trying to explore, according to Episcopalians. We're trying to say, does it tell us about salvation? Does it get us there? Yes, it does. Is it logically coherent? You're going to have to wrestle hard with that one. I mean, the only way you can get there is to say, like, well, these are two different sermons. They're the identical one. But, you know, preachers, they bring out the same material over and over again. So it's twice. He was like, that worked so well in Cana. I'm going to go do it in Nazareth. It's going to be great. And they called him back. And they said, please don't plagiarize yourself. So that's scripture. We'll stop there before I move to tradition. Questions about scripture? Yes, ask that question. You in the closet. Why you got to bring up the Apocrypha? This was so neat and tidy. So what about the Apocrypha? Have you all the, the Apocrypha? So in uh, our version of the Bible, the NRSV, which is what most mainline traditions, Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians use, they're almost always printed with the Apocrypha included. Many Catholics also, Bibles will come printed with the Apocrypha included. Before we talk about what it means, it should be noted historically that the reason why Apocrypha were often excluded from printed editions of the Bible post like in the colonial era as missionaries were going out was size and cost they were actually omitted because it was like that's a lot of extra pages that aren't technically scripture why are we including them um they are pseudo canonical which means they bear some of the same truths as what the canon like the canonical gatherings of the church that created scripture believed were scripture they had they met the requirement but they also were kind of iffy. And so the, 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 the groups that were meeting did not include them. And so be, to avoid uh, all the conflicts, they're like, but, but, but we should read them. So if you, particularly if you go to a Catholic service uh, for weddings often and occasionally uh, other services, you'll get them showing up in the lectionary rotation. Um, in the Episcopal church, they come up in like very special services we might borrow from them. But we always, they're not scripture. Uh, in the same sense. They don't bear the same weight of inerrancy. Um, so, uh, no, they're, they're pseudo scripture. They're like, again, just to make it complex, like kind of, not really. They certainly don't bear the same weight of authority. Um, but yeah, and I think like, uh, like you might hear, this is a horrible comparison, but I'll make it anyway. Like you might go to a, like a church and somebody says, at my wedding, I really want us to read this Mary Oliver poem. It's beautiful. It contains so much truth. I really want it read. Um, can we replace the Psalms with it? No, I'm sorry. We can't do that. But we can read it. Like, we'll read it. We will just read it 
after the scriptures and like maybe before the sermon so that we can include it. Like everybody will hear this, this poem. Um, we won't declare it a reading from Mary Oliver <laughs> and then end it with the word of the Lord. <clears throat> but it contains truth that should be honored in this space, especially because it speaks meaning to you. Um, and I think slightly more than that, but certainly less than scripture. That's where the non-canonical books list uh, sit. There are also these all these other gospels that have made it into the mainstream. Like people are talking about them now that were not in the apocrypha, like like gospels of Mary and uh, Thomas. Yeah, like there are some that are like like non-canonical. And anyway, those weren't even included in apoc you know, apocryphal books. They're just other gospels. There were hundreds of gospels. I don't think that's what most people realize is that there were not just the four. There were literally hundreds. Most of them written like three or four hundred years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Whereas John, the one we regard as the oldest or the young, the newest, uh, probably 200 years after Jesus' birth. So still much closer in time. All right. John is the most recent. It was the last one written. Uh, scholars more or less agree that Mark was the first. Uh, written within probably uh, 60 years of the death of Jesus, uh, or sorry, 30 years of the death of Jesus, so about 60 AD, um, and John somewhere between 150, 100 to 150, 180 years after the death of Jesus. Um, that there's a lot less agreement, but they they can tr they can tie some of the things that they think the community that created John's gospel were kind of like coding into their critique of culture around them. And what was happening in their community, they can trace that back to other historical like commentary about what was happening in the Christian community and say, that's probably, it sounds like they're having this argument and they're working it out in the gospel. So like using only these sayings from Jesus and these sayings from Jesus. Because um, that's how Christians do. I mean, we like to like have our fights, but like pin them to what Jesus said. Totally making Jesus out to be the bad guy. Um, that was the other thing I, I, I failed to say, and that was, um, oh shoot, ah, it was right in my tip of my tongue. It'll come back to me, sorry. So tradition, this is the really squidgiest of all of them. What is tradition? Like who gets to decide what the tradition is? Um, Obviously, the, the councils of the church, those earliest gatherings of the first community of Jesus are part of the tradition. So church fathers and mothers, desert mothers and fathers, uh, definitely the councils that agreed on things like what was the creed going to be, um, those in many cases predate uh, some of our scriptures so or coalesce around them. So those are part of tradition, and it's really important. Um, I said of John, uh, excuse me, Mark was the first gospel. Um, if Mark was the first gospel, he was probably writing his gospel at the same time that Paul was writing his letters. And so there's this wondering about whether Mark, Luke, and Matthew were in conversation or their communities, because it's never sure if it was an individual or groups of people that were wrestling with these things and then writing them down, um, but that they were in conversation some ways with and Peter and some of the early apostles. So you can kind of get the sense if you read the letters like, oh, that's a theme that was in the gospels. They must have at least read each other or talked to each other. Um, here are some of our sources of tradition. In the Episcopal Church and in Anglicanism, like the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox tradition, we have a thing we like to call apostolic succession, which is a very expensive word for the historic episcopate, which is another really expensive word for saying the history of our descending from bishop to bishop to bishop. The apostles, we believe, were the first sent out by Jesus. So you can read that in the gospel. Jesus said, um, I send you out, um, carry no cloak or extra change of clothes or you know, pouch with you. And, and so he commissions the apostles, their disciples first, their followers, they're like following on the way. And then Jesus is getting ready to, to depart this world. So you get these, these scenes of like sending and a, a, a apostleship means to be sent. It uh, shares the same root with mission, to be sent out, to be launched. Um, so apostolic succession means that from the hands of Jesus to these first apostles to today, 
the church can trace its lineage from apostle to apostle. And so the bishops became those first apostles. They went out as missionaries and planted churches. And then those churches sort of responded to their apostleship. They kind of were in connection with their teaching, with their leadership. Like no elders were made elders without the hands of that apostle. Um, and to this day, uh, we have honored that tradition and we do it through the three orders of or ordained clergy and the order of the laity. So the four orders, lay, deacon, priest, and bishop. It's important to see them as orbiting around, not as a succession of like increasing popularity or importance. <clears throat> um, in the more Protestant side of the tradition, we remember the priesthood of all believers, that sense that Paul talks about, that each of us is made a priest in the order of Melchizedek, and that each of us has a job that is priestly in the sense of making sacred the whole world. But we also have priests who are also called presbyters, uh, elders. Uh, Thomas Cramner, that was mentioned last week, retained the term priest for presbyters. Uh, and then also we've retained the diaconate. Um, some of our tradition comes through the governance of the Episcopal Church General Convention, which is our triennial gathering. Every three years, we gather to make decisions about things like belief and practice. If we were to get a new prayer book, it would happen through the orders of General Convention. Um, and then, I hear you. I'm, I, there are days when I could not agree more. Um, there are also the governance of our diocese. So our diocese is meeting, thank you, new bishop, uh, on the, the weekend leading up to All Saints Sunday, so this weekend. Um, so after we do all soul services and get ready for baptisms, we will actually be luckily gathering virtually this year, but we will be gathering with all Episcopalians from across Minnesota who are in our diocese, which is in a geographic province of the church. Um, but local level, we have what's called a vestry. It's the board of people who help guide our church and they're elected through a democratic process here. Uh, delegates to convention are elected democratically and delegates to the general convention are elected democratically. There is a house of delegates, which are priests, deacons, and lay people. And then there's always the house of bishops. And like the legislature of our nation, it's bicameral. There are checks and balances. There's a presiding bishop, president. It, it definitely, you could tell whoever was reading the playbook of the founding of the country was also like deeply involved in the founding of the Episcopal Church. And there is a lot of overlap, both for good and ill. But our tradition includes creeds, like the Apostle Creed, uh, which we say at baptisms and at funerals, uh, the Nicene Creed, which we say at, um, at Eucharist, and the Athanasian Creed, which is too long to say anywhere because you'll get tired and run out of energy, um, which is why we have the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. Was that the councils of the church and that was like the earliest people saying like we need to figure out what we believe because <laughs> joe the apostle was saying over here in ephesus that we believe that jesus put on divinity like a cloak he kind of just wrapped himself up in it and i'm reading here in paul that doesn't sound like what paul is saying and so councils had to be convened so that people could literally duke it out because they did. It was like political and physical and it was passionate. I mean, that's, that's the, the negative side is like, yeah, conflict, we did that, not so well. But at least we were passionate about it and we worked out our issues. And it comes down to, uh, it, it can be remembered in an old adage, we always say, doesn't make one iota of difference, right? The Greek iota, I, it was was uh, hotly debated in the word homoousios um, and or uh, homoousios. And it was the difference between of one substance and or of being. Like it was sort of like this, this debate and the iota made all the difference in what that word meant. And it's in the creed. Um, that's where that comes from. What was that? <clears throat> Oh, uh, three, like, so the, the Council of Nicaea was like in the 320, 330, something like that. So right after Constantine was like, okay, this is all Christian now, but what do we believe? Let's get it sorted. So the, the, uh, that's when the council started. Actually, there were, there were- And there were some before that, weren't there? 
Yeah, I was going to say there's there's a few councils before that. That was the most important one. That was the, uh, yeah. because that was the like the settling of the divinity of Jesus. Um, and so Homo Lucius was a uh, Homo Lucius is of one substance. And so that's why we say in the Episcopal Church, the Nicene Creed and not just the Apostles Creed. It's it's the whole line from uh, God from God, light from light. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> excuse me um the the whole bit that part is specifically the nicene creed because that's what they agreed on is that jesus is of the same substance and not uh because that that came from the sorry i'm going on a nerd rant but that came from um the debate of arius and athanasius or the arian controversy and um arian heresy you might know. Yeah, they weren't just uh, uh, council debates because uh, people got uh, labeled heretics and then killed. So <laughs> that's what I was saying. Like it got physical and then it got yeah. deadly. Yeah, because <clears throat> so, you know if you can't if you can't win, like at least make sure your opponent is now off the the board. Funny <clears throat> enough, uh, one of my <clears throat> one of my favorite stories from uh, this particular council was I think. <laughs> I always get confused between uh, Arius and Athanasius, but um, I'm pretty sure uh, St. Nicholas, who we base Santa Claus off of, uh, stood up in the middle of the council and punched Arius? In yes. The face. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, my favorite meme is always like, remember, <laughs> don't be naughty, because St. Nick will punch you in the face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's... That's all I got. No, that's good. This is a good example of like recently in seminary, remembering all the notes from the test on this and like 15 years out. So um, thank you. Keep me honest. Yes, please. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Oh, so for not sure. Only what was in the text, but what right. Spoken in and then written in, and then translated from, and then again translated. Look at the internet, written in Koine. Right. right. <laughs> well, and, and um. I'm wondering, you know, yeah, most seminaries, most seminarians in the Episcopal tradition are required to learn one language, usually Greek or Hebrew. <laughs> You could choose. Um, a lot of seminarians take both to get like a rudimentary understanding. But the way that uh, scholarship and technology have come available, like uh, translation resources, actually, there's a thing called Bible Works. Back in my day, I don't know if it still exists. If there's a newer thing, but you like literally mouse over every word in, in a scripture translation, and it will give you every codex that it was referenced and the different like translations, mistranslations, editions. So you can kind of like a scholar is sitting on your shoulder saying, and "Then there's this." But it is nice to know how to read some basics of the language for your own need in interpreting. But speaking of how things get passed on, so much of our tradition liturgically was lost to the tides of time, both because of archaeology and language. And there were actually a lot of discoveries leading up to Vatican II that was the huge liturgical revival of the Catholic Church that really influenced us, influenced to some degree the Lutheran Church and to some degree the Methodist Church. Um, which was the recovery of older documents that predated medieval litur liturgical resources. Um, and so in many ways, the new worship of the church is actually more ancient than it has ever been because it's appealing to pre-medieval uh, source material. Um, we obviously include in our tradition the, the sacraments uh, for the Episcopal Church uh, and most Protestants who agree that there are sacraments. They're the two principal sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, but uh, many Episcopalians would say there are sacraments that, uh, like the Catholic Church, that are all seven, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll include those. You could say, like, there are the great sacraments, and then there are sacramental rites. It really is, like, open to interpretation, but what is not open to interpretation is there are two principal sacraments that, from which sacramental life derives all of its meaning, baptism and Eucharist, and both of them point to the Paschal mystery, which is really a fancy way of saying the Passover mystery of of Jesus. So what the mysterious part being like, how did we participate in that? That's mysterious. How did that happen? And the Passover being death to life, uh, much in the same way that the Jewish people understand Passover, but in a corporate sense. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, one of the ways we remember uh, our tradition is in the Episcopal Church is through this uh, fancy phrase, lex orandi, lex credendi. And Jay may have mentioned this, but the Latin being the law of, of prayer is the law of, of belief. Uh, and so the way we worship shapes our believing, which is why the shape of our prayer book and the words in it are so instructive to our belief. And that gets us to the prayer book tradition. I'm falling willfully behind, but we'll, we'll stop there. Oh, questions about tradition? Um, I just, I just, uh, Scripture has primary, right? That is sort of filled in by tradition and interpreted by a second primary. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was like the seat on the stool. Right. Um, is, is there a sense of like that, that anyway, even today within the sort of broader Anglican tradition, obviously the people give different weight in a way. They think a little bit more on scripture, a little bit more on tradition, a little bit more on reason. People sort of like, I mean, I guess how does that sort of play out in sort of like the broader communion yeah. and you know the broader Anglican tradition in general? And how much of that is sort of just personal kind of like preference? Some of it's regional. So I mean, right. like if you want to trace, um, like Anglicanism spans the globe, sadly right. followed the colonial impulse to go everywhere and conquer all things. And so um, not new and unique to us, but we certainly perfected it as Anglicans. That's great, good on us. Um, but interestingly, the branches of missionary societies, which is what they were called in England, uh, there was the CMS or the Church Missionary Society, and then there was the uh, USPG or the United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. One was like born of the evangelical movement in Anglicanism, and one was born of the high church movement. And so wherever those missionaries went, you can see Anglicanism looks very different in different countries based on both the unique charisms of the people and, and like existing spiritual practices, but also the kind of belief that was brought. Um, so it is, it spreads out differently in different places. In most Episcopal churches, that hooker sense of like the stool and the scripture being supreme has kind of been lost to being like a triangle and it's sort of three things, kind of like more like the Methodist quadrilateral. Everything has to lean on each other to be stable. I don't know if you really need to parse it because the metaphor works. If you move one leg, the whole thing collapses. So primacy, I guess, to scripture, it leans more Protestant. But I know a lot of good high church Anglo Catholics who are like, no, no, that's why we put the gospel in the middle of the room and even bring out incense and like crosses and vergers and all of that because it's so pre preeminent. Um, but it varies. I don't remember the dates. That, that's a debate that often comes. Yeah. So the, yeah. the faith works question particularly is always prominently asked by Lutherans coming because the whole, that was, that was Luther's beef, right? Like they couldn't, can't get saved by works mm -hmm. alone. It, it, like sola fide, sola scriptura. Those were the two sources of, I mean, for him, authority was only in the scriptures and the only way you could get saved was through faith. Um, and so a lot of other Protestant traditions were wrestling around with that in different ways. Uh, for Methodists, there is this sort of Anglican leaning, like the praxis part, and that's where it falls, is like orthopraxy. Yeah. And I think that's why uh, Luther could not handle James as a scriptural, like he would have had, gladly put that in the apocryphal literature, because there is a declaration in one spot that's so like, if you're an inerrantist or a fundamentalist, you can't ignore what you're saying, like, you know, if you have not love and you're not doing these things, then your salvation is, you know, mute. Uh, moot, not yeah, moot. Moot. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he referred to it as the epistle of straw. He was not happy about it. <laughs> Luther did. Yeah. Uh, so then we get to reason. If you don't know, now you know. Um, the sources of reason, obviously, these are a lot easier. Like we know what reason is in our in our tradition scholarship within the wider academy, within schools, communities of religious learning, discernment, that spiritual practice that takes our reason, places it before God and asks holy questions about what we know and like asking God's guidance on it. Um, judging, perceiving, knowing, wisdom. You know, the interesting thing is, is that modern science is telling us actually that there is no such thing as the Vulcan sense of knowing, right? We all, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know, like the completely rational beings who have no emotion. 
we're the prize of the galaxies and of the universe. And we as moderns, particularly in the West think, and especially here in like the like somewhat uh, Scandinavian part of this part of the West, think that like cold, irrational thinking people can be achieved. And it's just scientifically not possible. You can't, I mean, a doctor cannot diagnose without a gut. Like it's been shown on like, on, not only on the gut, but the gut, where we like put gut in here, the feeling centers of the brain, like decisions can't be made without some choice, some choosing. Um, and that means that we have to be affected as much as we are knowledgeable. And that means that our feelings are a part of our reasons, much as we'd hate to say it, there's no such thing as pure rational discourse and life. Um, isn't that funny how God made us that way? Um, but reason also, I think for many of our Christian brothers and sisters who are outside of a tradition that has a high regard for reason, and we've seen this, it's really easy to like poke fun at the culture. And so I won't do that. But we certainly know as Christians, like, trust God and hope that you're going to be fine is not the way we approach faith. We say like, trust God and make sure you're following the latest science, like, because you can trust it. It's not its own thing. Science isn't a thing. It's a process. And it actually comes in large part out of a rational tradition in Christian circles in the West, at least there was a high uh, prize for rational discourse and being able to, to parse things and to follow where the science would go. We have great examples of where that wasn't the trace, you know, like case like Galileo and, and others. Like we like to like point at those and we're like, look, this is where the church interfered. But like, we forget that like Galileo got his science because he went to academies that were founded by churches saying we need to know the universe. Um, he just happened to be the unlucky fool who poked a big hole in some of what we knew. It's still true in sciences today, right? Like, I don't know if you saw this, there, there's a new finding that says our belief about the migrations of humans onto our continent may be completely and 100% wrong. That the Beringian like land bridge theory, which is what 90% of our like anthropology, sociology, history classes were taught on, and still somewhat plausible, is actually being uncovered by archaeology saying like, no, there's thousands of years before that bridge would have existed. There's evidence of human, you know, humanity on this continent. So, so talk at me. What, how did that happen? Right. And so science doesn't go, I mean, some science is like, no, and you're wrong. And like people get crucified in like whatever scholarly publications publish that. But for the most part, science will then move on and like incorporate that knowledge. We can too as Christians. One of, one of the hardest things for me coming from the evangelical tradition I remember was uh, particularly growing up, having Bible classes and going to church and being told things that were very, very not true about the origin of the planet and of the, of the cosmos. Like it's 6,000 years old or 7,000 years old or 10,000 years old. And then having people who have no scientific background appealing to a few like scientists out there to give some like, like patina of science to it. Um, when in fact, there's nothing that can disrupt God's truths in the world by knowing that the universe is billions and perhaps hundreds of billions of years old, that doesn't, that doesn't disrupt scripture. In fact, when we got to sem a college and I went to a, a pretty conservative college, the very first class we all had to take was a Bible course. And the very th first thing we read in that Bible course, many Episcopalians don't even know this to be true, was reading the first two chapters of Genesis. Have you ever sat down and done a side by side of the first two chapters of Genesis? It's fascinating, right? It'll completely upend any notion that the Bible is trying to make a historical statement. Because on chapter one, you get, this is how the earth was made. And then in chapter two, you get, and also it was made this way. And it was very different. And the order is out of order. And if it, there's a lot of debate within scholarly communities, but. Yeah, and they're like, there's like, you know, effort, efforts from two communities trying to reconcile the two, so that's why they're included. Um, but it's was fascinating. Question? Was that? What was the question? I didn't hear it. The the was one of the, the first one older than the second one. Okay. Or the okay. second one, the second one older than the first one. Sorry. I see. Um, so in my uh, Hebrew Bible class, we learned that. Um, not that one is necessarily older than the other, but you have a few different authors who kind of appeal to um, uh, different 
uh, societies with different needs. So you have one God, the, the argument that uh, we were presented is that you have one God, <coughs> excuse me, um, who represents a more, a more imminent God who mm -hmm. uh, is very involved with the creation of humans and, and creatures. And then you have one that is transcendent, that is beyond uh, what we can uh, really even imagine ourselves. And uh, depending on where the society was or what they needed in order to have God be a God, you have uh, different views or exposures to what God is. You know, uh, of course, at that time, God is more important to people who, who are oppressed, hungry, and needy versus, right. you know, what we see a lot of the time now, who are people that go to church, at, at least in the Midwest, who are mostly white and somewhat affluent, you know, that's a, a different version of God than the God that the Hebrew, ancient Hebrews needed. Um, so, so uh, oh, sorry, what were you going to say? No, uh, I was going to say, and I think that's why it's important that the tradition included both stories. Like, even when I say the tradition, we mean those early Jewish communities that hashed out what was going to be in, in Genesis, right? They were taking their oral traditions and, and inscribing them, and perhaps even in different communities and then reconciling that, that's our tradition too. That's not just scripture. There's The tradition is in the scripture. You can see it underneath the scripture and woven into it. Um, so, sorry, it, anything else, Cameron? Yeah, yeah. Um, the only other thing I was gonna add there is also the, the Jewish perspective on history too is a little bit different than ours. Right. Um, you know, with the, with the um, Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, you know, history it was viewed as um, the story that are told and the experiences that communities had. So, despite the fact that um, uh, the stories in the Bible weren't uh, chronologically true in history, they were true uh, a true historical representation for that community itself. So, they regarded it as a truth that. Um, we as modern Westerners don't quite understand that methodology of saying this mm -hmm. is this is the part of our history, but these stories that they use to, you know, uh, there's so many other things in the Bible that are just, um, you know, incongruent with what reality would be like, you know, there are in uh, some of the later chapters in the Hebrew Bible, you know, when you talk about the wars with the uh, Canaanites and whatnot, they talk about the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that were in these armies. And they just, there weren't even that, that many people couldn't have existed in Israel at that time, you know, but they, right. They say these to their people uh, as a way of enriching them in their belief, and that is history for them. So there's there's this knowledge that you know uh, these stories may be allegorical, but they were still treated as historically true. Um, but history for them is multifaceted. It's not just chronological is I guess the lesson that I'm putting there. So you have this history with the two different versions of the creation story um, that, you know, if you ask, is it true? You may get a varied answer because history at that time is not the way that we look at history now. So you can say yes, it's <laughs> yes, and. And I, um, we, we'd like to think when we talk about these things and we're talking about some somewhere out there in the past, a lesser knowledgeable, lesser than us people, right? We, we kind of look at our, our, our ancient forebears as not as enlightened as we are. And yet, if you look at our own current debates in our country right now about history, right? We're talking about history sacralized versus history actually, right? And that um, on the one hand, for those, who, for those who are deeply concerned, as you might be, um, about telling history in its full complexity, uh, that's the concern, is that we're, we're ruining the sacred story of our nation. And there's some, I think there's some validity to pay, like to giving honor to why our sacred stories are sacred to us as a people, as a nation. Um, but also we can tell the other stories. Right. 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 Process is new. It's right, right. It's the right. ideas of, of, of history as a story to tell about a community where we came from, right? 
Well, this is the same sense like, you know, did George Washington chop down a cherry tree? No, but the point is not that he didn't do it, right? The point is that it's setting him up as an exemplary figure. Right, right. Or even I think set up a lot of debates. I think about stuff a lot all the time as a historian, right? Yeah. But like, you know, the, who do we choose to honor and things like that? What kind of stories we're telling about ourselves, right? You know, like, well, could you, should you have a statue of Robert E. Lee? Should you not, right? right. What does that tell us, right? right. What, kind of, what can we learn about that? What, what kind of complexity does that embody, right? And so these big debates are like that. It isn't so much like, oh, did he do this or did he not do that? It's, it's a symbolic figure. Right? Yeah. Right, 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 right. And, and I think that's the, um, the beauty and the danger and the scariness, the risk. I think Jay talked about this in his sermon today, like when we love people, we, it's risky. Yeah. And I think uh, when we engage in the telling of our stories, we're engaging in something far closer to like passion, love and feeling, right? Than we are into like uh, learning rational discourse. And I think that's a, that's a fascinating place actually for us to, to kind of pause today's conversation is, what does it mean that we tell these stories about ourselves? And if you read scripture and our whole tradition, with your reason and your passion, where do you see the, the, tr the whole of it interacting and engaging in this process of refinement? Because every book of the Bible is a commentary on other books of the Bible. And in within, even in Genesis, as we just talked about, there are commentaries on traditions we've held within that book itself. So the Psalms are different lenses on experience of God, experience of, of anger, and, and different experiences of the history of the Jewish people. The Gospels are different remembrances, different stories and telling, and they're trying to refine each other. They're actually wrestling with each other, um, sometimes complementing, a lot of times contradicting, and always refining. Um, I, we're over time, but I'm really grateful uh, for your rigorous engagement today, and I look forward to our final couple classes. And Cameron, I hope you are well on, on your way to recovery. We miss you. Um, let us go in the Go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the spirit. Thanks be to God. Thanks for coming today, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you, Jared. Take care, Cameron. Feel free to sign off. Okay. Let me pull up my, um, my roster. Let's see here. Basics. Yeah, I think credit. Yes. I think that might be Cameron. I, mean, I don't have my uh, my schedule. Take care, Micah. Thank you. Yeah. Have a happy Halloween. You guys doing Halloween? Well, yeah, so we got to be, we're, we're going to do, um, yeah, we will. Yeah. Um, trick or treating? Here, exactly. What's so, that? There's stuff happening here too, right? Yeah, five o'clock, we're going to do a, a service. We're calling it liturgical drag. Um, I don't know. Liturgical? Uh, yeah, it's, we're actually doing the liturgy of uh, 